So uh, my topic uh, this afternoon is about uh, modularity in uh, public knowledge bases, uh, which would include both the semantic web as a whole, uh, as a source of linked data, and it would include particular systems such as DBDIA or FreeBase or other such systems. So here is a table of uh, what I want to talk about. Uh, a few words about my background, uh, to put my message into perspective. Uh, my main theme, which is modular organization of the knowledge base. Uh, I have a few reasons for being interested in this. One has to do with agents, uh, autonomous intelligent agents. Uh, the other reason is my interest in the continuous process where data or video knowledge is being refined, restructured and modified. And uh, what are the processes which can help contribute to that. I will give a few examples of how a modular structure can be used. And then I will say a few words about each of a few topics. Standardization of vocabularies, which is desirable but not always possible. Uh, if a choice of knowledge representation language, uh, issue of peer review as uh, for, for uh, validating contents on other bases, and uh, attribution issues. Okay, my own background is uh, uh, that I consider uh, knowledge representation as a branch of artificial intelligence research as my major scientific field. Uh, the, the second, third, and fourth items on the list are the areas where I've spent most of my uh, work uh, over the years, uh, reasoning about actions and effects for the purpose of planning and prediction and uh, for, uh, for the execution of actions in autonomous robots. Uh, feasible inheritance, which is what happens if you have a hierarchy of concepts which is not entirely strict, but you have exceptions. Like you would say that uh, mammals are, to take one classical example, uh, mammals live on the ground with the exception of weights of various kinds which are mammals but live in the water. So we have to handle these types of exceptions in the Dutch ontology. And uh, this may sound simple, but there are a number of intriguing difficulties which come up. Uh, autonomous intelligent agents, uh, one project around 1990 on uh, automatic cars, and another project on, uh, on manned area vehicles, uh, which I started in 1997 and left, left over to uh, in 2005. Workflow systems, which I thought would be a good application of AI techniques, and it turned out they weren't at the time, at least. And then, besides AI as such, I've been always been interested in the issue of the software system infrastructure for AI systems. Unfortunately, the programming languages and all the representation languages, and so on. And finally, on sometimes a somewhat different area, I've been interested uh, for quite a while in the issue of alternative publishing mechanisms in science, not only open access publishing, but also open reviewing methods. I started the journal of that kind in the 90s. Okay, so this is my background. So this relates in, so from this list you see that semantic web is not my home area as such, but there are a number of connection points. So the first one is that uh, at this point I uh, I and the AI community, I think, in general, view the developments in semantic web as a fantastic uh, resource. Because for many years, 80s, 90s, we've been saying that uh, obviously real intelligent systems need to have uh, a knowledge background, they must have a knowledge base, but where do we get it from? How can we expect to obtain all the knowledge that is required in a truly intelligent system? And for a long time, it seemed like uh, something that would be very difficult and very costly. And now, during the last five years or so, uh, of course, the avalanche, the enormous volume of knowledge that is accumulated uh, in the semantic web movement becomes a very resource for us. At the same time, it becomes, uh, uh, or how should we say, something that we have to keep up with. A few years ago, people in AI would say that uh, semantic web is a good application. We see they are using description logic that we developed in, we are in, developed in the 1980s. They are using rule-based systems. We've done that, that for a long time. A nice application. Today, we cannot say that because we see there are so many new interesting things that happen 
even though it is an antiquated area, that we must keep up with that which sometimes may be duplicates within the building, sometimes not, and we really just have to see it. But, and still, of course, we still also see, or I see, I, I hope to see possible additional contributions from our field to the Africa, for example, machine learning. So, uh, this is very interesting for me, uh, for several points of view. I'm very grateful for the invitation to come here to listen to all the other talks. But at the same time, since I'm in a way a little bit of an outsider also, this gives me the opportunity to, to say yes, yes, but maybe there are some other ways of looking at things, uh, just in order to stimulate the discussion. And the main theme of my talk is such a, such a but. Um, if you think back at the introductory presentation by Sir Lauer this morning, he started by showing the picture of the walled gardens, the gardens inside walls, and saying, let's tear down the walls, let's have one big garden. And uh, my opposite suggestion is to say, well, wait a second, maybe sometimes it is important to have the walls, to see the entire structure as consisting of many gardens with walls and with well-defined ways of crossing the walls. So it is in this sense that I'm talking about the, the difference between a, a uniform and a modular view of knowledge basis and a cinematic way. So just to clarify it and comment on the picture, by the uniform view, I mean the view where you say that at least in the long run and at least abstractly, we talk about one enormous conceptual network with many, many nodes and with links between the nodes uh, and it's just one structure that can be queried and used. And the alternative, the modular view, is to say, no, it's, it's not like that. It's a library of knowledge modules. Each knowledge module is a little network or whatever representation you want to use in it. And then these modules can be downloaded into application systems. Each application system can select which modules does it wish to download and to use for itself. And conversely, some applications will want to contribute modules to the library. So it is the second approach that I will be talking about, not as an alternative. I'm not saying everybody should do that. I'm just saying for some purposes, from some points of view, this is a useful way of looking at it. So why is that? Uh, well, I have two, two major, two, maybe three, yeah, three major reasons for proposing this perspective. One is the perspective of autonomous agents, the other one is the validation issue, quality control, and so on. And the third one has to do with attribution and provenance, so say, specify who did what, who owns what, who is responsible for what. So I'll take these three things one at a time. <coughs> autonomous intelligent agents, which of course is a classical, also a classical topic in, in artificial intelligence. For me, an, an agent is a system that performs actions which means that it is, now you can say every program performs actions, especially every program that operates in the real world. But to qualify as an agent, it must be more than that. It must be action aware, in the sense that it not only executes actions, but it is able to reason about actions. It can maintain the representation of its own actions, its future actions, its past actions, it can make plans. It can execute a plan, observe failure, and diagnose it, and revise the plan uh, when the problem arises. It can have a dialogue about its current plans, and so on. Uh, so one, the defining concept for an agent then is it's action aware, but this is only possible in most cases if it also has a model of its environment where it is operating, physical environment or uh, information environment. Uh, so it uses this model in order to select actions and evaluate actions. Uh, this tends to encourage a software technology that is interpretation oriented. We're going to use languages such as this or, or, uh, or, or other related languages, uh, Python, let's say, uh, rather than typical compilation languages. Uh, so, from this point of view, uh, this model of the environment can sometimes be of limited size, but sometimes it has to be quite large. And that is where the connection to the knowledge base comes in. So, I will mention two, two examples of such systems I've been working with. 
One is Bisvita's project, where we were interested in, uh, in uh, uh, helicopter, autonomous helicopters, uh, uh, agents that fly, so, so ro robots that fly, if you wish. Uh, so the goal of the project was to equip these uh, Yamaha helicopters with onboard systems whereby they can uh, observe the environment using video camera and, and other tools, uh, make a model of the environment, uh, they see goals, specification of what they are supposed to do, uh, and uh, execute the plan and then come back and uh, spend a, a report that uh, they have done the right thing. Uh, so this requires a model of the operation area. Uh, and of the objects that are in so you can realize it needs a geographical database of some kind, uh, a model of what are the important objects in that area, uh, stationary objects, mobile objects, uh, persons in the area, etc. So now this is this is a typical robot application in some ways, you can compare it to robots that uh, walk move around in a laboratory, but it has some salient Important characteristics. One is that if you're buying, if you buy a helicopter like that one and you want to go out and fly it and they're fun, uh, you're not allowed to. Because in all the reasonable situations, well, in peacetime situations at least, there are, are very strict rules for when you can do this, it has to be a separate area, and in particular, there has to be a certification of, uh, of the flying vehicle made by the aviation authorities of each country. And these, uh, this certification process requires an analysis of exactly what is the system, what are the different properties of the system, and what can you say about their quality, their predictability, what they can do, what they cannot do. And this will, will involve all aspects of what is in the system, including its own more uh, knowledge base. Uh, the, other, come back to that. the other example is uh, where I was also involved is of an entirely different character, uh, not real world. It was for supporting the cycle or the writing cycle of a research article, starting with the cooperation between the authors in one of the, the more research labs, and then through the preparation of the article, submission to a journal, reviewing the vision of the article. Uh, Publication by the commercial publisher, publication in the open access repository, and so on. Uh, so this uh, this is a complex process, which is a chore for the researcher and where you would like to give someone automatic support. One part of it, uh, which is an entirely interesting and relatively complex part, is managing the restrictions that publishers impose when authors want to put their articles on their own web pages. Uh, different publishers have different rules and you will be amazed or at least somewhat surprised at the variety and complexity of the rules that different publishers impose. So these rules then must be satisfied and must be obeyed by whoever operates the open, open access repository. So we built a system that, uh, that uh, did perform this service. There, there again, it's important for the system to be correct, not only usually correct, but always correct, because there are legal implications. Okay, so if we consider applications such as these, autonomous agent applications, from the point of view of what I showed you before, the uniform view or the modular view. If you take the uniform view, then the application, the, the, the gray box to the right, is likely to send specific information requests to the uniform knowledge base each time it needs some piece of information. So it operates using queries and using the answer from those queries. Which means that as the uniform global knowledge base evolves, improves with corrections and updates with new information, then that information is always available to the, to the agent, which is fine. Uh, in the other alternative, now I'll simplify things, but still you have to do that as first. The agent is going to contain some modules, which it downloaded from the global knowledge base, the modular knowledge base. It downloads the modules at one point in time, uses them, and it's only going to obtain updates and revisions if it explicitly 
downloads the modules again to create the modified versions of the modules. Now, which of these alternatives is preferable? Now, each has its pros and cons, but notice that if safety is at a very high importance, like in the case of the UAV, then there are specific advantages with the second one. Because consider, for example, just to take one concrete example from the unmanned uh, aerial vehicle, if it flies over a city area, which it is not allowed to do today, but hopefully that is flying over a city area, it's going to need uh, a model of the, city, of the buildings in the city and the uh, altitude, how high up are they, what are the passages between them, and it is going to combine that with its observations with its own video and uh, laser range factor and so on. Uh, it will combine the information. Now, suppose somebody is, suppose you're using the first approach with the global knowledge base, and somebody is able to modify and disturb the global knowledge base with incorrect information about the buildings, where they are, what is their location, what is their altitude, then that is going to, that can severely confuse the operation of the UAV. Uh, presumably not so that it will crash into the buildings, more of us than that, but at least it confuses it so much that it cannot carry out its mission, which in itself can be very problematic in some situations. So from the point of view of verifiability and robustness and security against intrusion and so on, there are some advantages with having a closed system in the agent so that you have full control of what is in there and what is up to. Okay. So that is the uh, Uh, the other perspective I want to put on this is um, uh, ah, sorry. okay. So this is as seen from the point of view of the knowledge base. Now, if you're going to have intelligent agents that obtain their knowledge module from the global global knowledge base, then what are the consequences for the agent? And I see that from the point of view of the, the, the systems infrastructure project that we can doing, which is called Leonardo, where basically the idea is that you have uh, a number of agents, as seen at the bottom of the picture, number one, two, and so on, uh, and then the common library of modules that agents can use. And from the development point of view in, in our project, the focus was initially on these agents, on the modular structure in the specific Leonardo agents. And then actually it came up as a second step to say, well, given that the agents are constructed using, uh, constructed as containing a set of, of knowledge modules, then we have a good use for a library of such modules that the agents can use. So the basic idea in, uh, in the Leonardo system is uh, each agent consists of knowledge modules and nothing else. Each agent is completely self-describing, so that uh, as it can analyze the contents of knowledge modules, it can also analyze all aspects of itself and of its operational circumstances. So it means, for example, to be complete, that given that each agent, each software agent, is located in a particular computer, and that computer is on a local area network, on which there are also other computers with their agents, this entire structure uh, is described in terms of nodes and the relations between the nodes. Okay, so this was the first perspective. Agents and the use of modules as a common structure and primitive in the agents and in the knowledge base. Uh, the second aspect which I wanted to bring up has to some extent been preempted by the Cernan's talk this morning. But what is important here is that if you take a global view of the development over the years, over the last years and over the forthcoming years, with respect to these very large scale uh, knowledge resources, then uh, the picture that you see is you have like a, a, a concurrent activity in a number of separate systems the Wikipedia, the Freebase, the Sumo, the CA World Book, and so on, WordNet, together with a number of more specialized resources. Each of them each of them develops over time, adding more information into itself, harvesting information from elsewhere, from more specialized sources, 
refining the information, correcting it, and so on. And sometimes you're taking information from each other. Uh, so that there is a big interchange, uh, and all the time all of them are changing that. Uh, now, the question that you can ask when you see the scenario sometimes is, why, <coughs> why, why is it like this? Why, why do people have to put information on the internet that is not yet there? Why couldn't people just do things right? First of all, and then put things on the net and then you don't have to change them. Except maybe for corrections, if there are really no changes. And the answer to that is, uh, well, there are a few answers, but the most important answer is that, well, all the interesting mechanisms for correcting the data and the knowledge and improving the data and evolving into the infrastructure require that it must be on the net. Uh, sometimes we are talking about the contributions by people, many, many people who make corrections. Sometimes we talk about the contributions of software uh, that do things more or less automatically. But in any case, the, uh, the internet global structure is not only the distribution resource, it is also, so to say, the workbench in which the data gradually evolves. And there are a number of examples of uh, what uh, is done in that, in that case. Uh, auto, uh, some of them are manual, but when you talk to automatic operations, automatic transformations of data items over many, many instances, uh, scanning a knowledge base for violations of syntactic rules or semantic restrictions, correcting it. We've heard of examples of that earlier today. Uh, more less, uh, or less mechanistic things are things such as if you have default rules, rules that apply in most cases, but not in all. You would like a system to be able to identify violations of the default and accept exceptions if they are really intended as exceptions, but to do something about it if they are, are, are not true exceptions, which may require a dialogue with experts. How does an automatic system have a dialogue with experts? Well, it needs the knowledge base of who are the, the experts on which topics and it must be capable of sending messages to these experts using some rather than communication mechanism. So there you see how reasoning about what, what things are one would like to do and how to grow in it. Uh, again, one comes back to the notion of agents that can do more and more things automatically, starting with simple things and then going to more complex ones. Uh, so the, the bottom line of, of this, uh, over the last few pages here, is that uh, all of these things one can think of doing using conventional computation technology, but an agent technology and a modular organization tends to be uh, to facilitate the work. Okay, so at that point I'll cover four of the items on my agenda. Uh, let me proceed to, uh, so summary of what I'm saying is that uh, my background comes from having a software architecture for autonomous agents that are organized as modules. Then it is natural to let the knowledge base be also the system of modules. And this has a number of other advantages. So now let me proceed to show you some examples of what you can do once you adopt the idea of modern modules in a consistent way, not only as, okay, we can divide things into modules, but doing as much as possible out of the modular organization. Uh, of course, if you look at the, uh, the, the current structures that we have in, in uh, uh, the various systems which have been mentioned, then you could say, well, they are not in a way, they are divided into sections and there are different files and so on. And Fine. So therefore also there is no opposition between the concept of modular and, and, and uniform. Uh, but suppose you take the modular concept seriously and want to do as much as possible of it, what happens? So in my case, starting with the basic idea of the knowledge box, uh, a unit that contains information about a number of entities, uh, one of the things you clearly want to do is to characterize the structure. And the first step in that direction is to specify uh, type information. What are the types, what are the attributes that are, or links that are associated with each type, or will be defined for members of the type, what should be the types of the values of the attributes, and so on. 
So let's call that a signature. And in a consistent view of knowledge blocks, the signature for a knowledge block is also a knowledge block. And this means, of course, that the signature also needs to have its description, so we have a super signature until we arrive at the point where the knowledge block describes itself. Uh, maybe already after two steps like this, or maybe after <coughs> several steps. Then, because uh, then the, the considerations uh, that we've seen before is the, these knowledge blocks are going to change over time. Signatures are going to change over time, although less frequently. And uh, what we want to do at each point during this, this change process is to be sure that the form of correctness is satisfied so that the knowledge block conforms to its signatures. But then we have not just one version of each knowledge block, we have the, the evolution over time. Which means that uh, version management is required. Uh, so we get to a structure which looks more like this. Uh, successive versions, signatures for each of them, and super signature. And this structure needs to be documented because consider the situation of an agent that has downloaded a number of knowledge blocks for its internal use. And it is interesting, or its owner is interested in downloading new versions of some of the knowledge blocks, but not the others. It wants to be able to, ver to verify that the new version of one of the knowledge blocks is compatible with an older version of another knowledge block. So there is a need for meta level meta information about these, with these versions and their character. So the way we do it in our system is to say, okay, we have a separate program that checks whether the knowledge block is consistent with the signature and it reports on the outcome of that validation. Uh, the report is of non trivial size, not just accept and no accept, but uh, maybe there is information with it, beginning of course with the version information. So we need a validation block, which is also an audit block and which characterizes this, uh, this uh, relationship. Uh, that extends to uh, the higher levels in the obvious way. Uh, and uh, already with this simple example, you see that the it starts to evolve a, a structure where the nodes in the structure are the various knowledge blocks and we are characterizing them from different points of view. The signature is a, basically contains the type information, but then on top of that you want to have a more expressive, a uh, more fine-grained specification of, uh, of restrictions, which means you need the ontology. It is natural to handle it in the same way, where one ontology may cover uh, the restrictions on several separate types of knowledge blocks with their respective signatures. So, um, when you see this figure, you may say, well, why does it have to be done in, in this way? Is it sufficient to just say that, well, we have our modules and we have our validation mechanisms, we have our type descriptions, we have our, our pathologies, and uh, what's the problem? And my point is that there are advantages in the long run with having a uniform way of representing these various kinds of information. So that everything is not in box with uh, their various characteristics. Uh, it allows a conceptual economy, it allows concise documentation, it allows rapid learning, and it, it uses software tools and, and so on. Okay, so much about modules and, uh, and uh, the documentation of the informal structure of modules. Uh, then a brief comment on another topic, standardization of vocabularies. Uh, in um, uh, the uniform view of the large knowledge base, uh, it, it, really, it is desirable that each concept in the world, representing an object or a person or other phenomenon of some kind, that each such phenomenon should be represented by exactly one name. So that if, uh, so if you take that viewpoint, then the, the existence of different identifiers for the same thing is seen as an anomaly which should be uh, eliminated at least asymptotically as the entire knowledge base evolves. Now, the problem with that is that maybe it is not realistic uh, because the reality is so complicated and the views of looking at the reality are so complicated and, and it may just be an overwhelming task. So just to take some simple examples, very simple examples. Consider the concept of a continent. 
in a geographical, uh, collection of geographical information. Uh, so Australia is one continent, and uh, North America is one, and South America is one, or maybe they are the same continent. So now, if you look at the definition of continent in the SUMO, suggested the upper virgin ontology, which is uh, apparently has been accepted as my GP standard, then it, it says that, uh, uh, that, that it becomes clear that you could define a continent either so that it is just the land mass of uh, a major land mass, or that it is a major land mass together with its outlying islands, islands on its continental shelf. And if you look in the sumo, then it says one thing in the verbal definition of what a continent is and another, and then it realizes it in, in, in a contrary way when you look at the definition of Australia. So, and if you continue with continents, well, uh, what about Greenland? Is Greenland part of the Eurasian continent, or is it part of the American continent, or is it its own continent? And what about Madagascar, and, uh, and so on? Uh, so, and of course, continents and countries and these things come up in a number of different contexts, a political contexts, a biological, a ecological contexts, and so on. Uh, another very simple example, you would think, what about fruits and vegetables? Uh, what, uh, we have a related concept, uh, fruit, vegetable, berry, and a few others. If you ask a biologist what is a fruit and what is a vegetable, and if you ask the European Union administrators what is a fruit and what is a vegetable, they have different opinions about that. And so you can continue. I mean, these are very simple concepts. What about when you get to more complex ones? So the alternative, the alternative possibility, which I think would have to carry separate weight, would be to say, in principle, in a modular organization, each module has its own namespace, its own set of names for the entities that are described there. And then, in principle, whenever you relate the concept, uh, the contents of two or more modules, you need to have a definition of how the namespaces correspond. Now, of course, in some cases, you are fortunate so that uh, you have to have the same meaning for the nodes in the different modules and then the transformation is trivial. But at least you have an explicit place in the architecture for defining that correspondence. That opens the possibility for doing non-trivial transformations and sometimes they, uh, I would argue, they are going to be not only one-to-one uh, -one correspondence or one-to-many correspondences, but they would be context dependent. So that if a, if a concept with a name in one module is imported into another context, then that concept will need to carry information about how it is going to be translated depending on the context where it is being used. Uh, which means you need a, a, a dynamical mechanism using uh, plug-in plug software rules or meta-level rules for, for establishing the correspondence not only when you merge the modules, but each time something in the module is being used computationally. Uh, so these considerations about modules, their meta-modules, their uh, signatures, ontologies, uh, name translation problems and so on uh, must serve as the background when you discuss what knowledge representation language will be adequate for using the models. Uh, now from the knowledge representation research point of view, of course, there is a whole range of available knowledge representation languages, starting with relational triples, which are the simplest ones, and uh, all the way up to full first order logic. Uh, as, as uh, computationally realized, for example, in the Kif language, and then a lot of things in between. And the, the, when you look at these, you always not, also notice that it is of course, always possible to express that rewrite a higher level notation in terms of a lower level. So even if you use uh, uh, frame systems or if you start for the logic, in principle, you can re-express what you say there in terms of relational triples, but at the expense of introducing a lot of auxiliary nodes and, and presumably auxiliary relations. So you can always do that. In a certain sense, relational triples is sufficient for everything, but it may be very cumbersome to use them that way. And in that perspective, the, the rule of thumb is for each application, choose the level of expressivity that best corresponds to the information you are dealing with, 
not lower and not higher. Not lower because it will be cumbersome, and not higher because it will be expensive in terms of limitation. Uh, is it reasonable in an application to allow multiple in, in an application to use multiple representations so that different modules have different representation inside them? Again, uh, it would be desirable to have the same representation throughout, but that may not always be, be, be appropriate either. In particular, because one of the strong uh, insights from other representation research is that quite often it is very important to be able to change the representation of the problem. So that if you are facing a conflict with problem of some kind, changing from one representation to another of a given information may be almost all that is needed in order to solve the problem. So we are going to need multiple representations anyway, and therefore you have to have a support for that, and therefore you can also accept modules with different representations. But of course, not necessarily because if there is always a cost. So you have to skip some of that. And just to give you one, one, one little example of this, suppose suppose you have suppose you are describing books. And for each uh, book item, like book number 12, it has a type, like book, uh, and it has a list of authors. And it is not appropriate to just have an author link from the book to the author, because the order of the authors is sometimes quite important for the authors, for books and the even more for research articles. So it's, it is better if you can consider the, the, the author information as an attribute where the value of the attribute is a structure linked to the sequence of the, the author identifiers. Now, now, as I said, this can of course be rewritten using auxiliary nodes, like here, one node for the author list or whatever, but it's conversion. Uh, so if you have this representation for the books, then you would like, like to specify what is the type of the book item and of the author item, and you would like to specify syntactically that the value type for the attribute as authors shall be a sequence where each of the elements shall be your type person. Uh, so this is what I mean. So this is one very simple example that I'm aware of where both the contents of the basic object module and the contents of the signature module need to contain not only nodes and links between nodes, but also some, some more complex structures. And of course, the more complex structures you allow in your object modules, the more complex structures you must allow in the, in the signatures and the ontology. Uh, okay, so then this raises again the question. Now, suppose we have a very large knowledge base. EBD, uh, web in general, whatever. If there is very large knowledge base, local knowledge base, which as a matter of principle represents things in terms of nodes and arts. Nodes and links. Uh, and then we have agents that have their own modules that require or choose to use a more complex representation language. How can they meet each other? What should be the quantity conventions whereby the agent uploads its modules to the knowledge base, or what should be the convention when it gets modules back from the knowledge base? Is it appropriate to require that? Uh, large universal knowledge base should be able to accommodate all types of new representation languages that people select to create because of course people are very creative in a, in a, in a, in a new knowledge uh, representation languages. Or should you request everyone to reduce, uh, every agent or every application to reduce its information to uh, the, the most primitive representation such as those and ours. Uh, and uh, there are several possibilities. Uh, what we have on the slide is, is actually more like an uh, invitation to discussion rather than a proposal. But one, one obvious uh, approach is to say that it should be up to the agent to do the conversion to the, so to say, common denominator, the simple representation, because it is in the agent that you have the surrounding information that is, is required for doing that transformation well. But that could also be argued against that position. Okay, so I've covered all but two of the items on my list. Uh, peer review of knowledge review about this. Uh, the use of signatures and ontologies and validation checks against uh, against these 
is uh, important in order to establish the form and a structural correctness of, of knowledge models. But of course, it is not sufficient for, for arranging that they are correct with respect to the real world. Uh, now, how can that better be done? Uh, one possibility which we have, which is illustrated by the DDP in particular, is to say, well, let's, let's base the work on information that is volunteered by, uh, by a lot of people, and then uh, expect the community of users to, to input corrections when corrections are needed. And uh, there are there are some strengths to that, uh, as has been demonstrated by the Wikipedia and, and its uh, uh, derived information structures. But it also has its problems. Uh, one other possibility, which I think should be worth considering, is make a comparison with how research articles are being had. Scientific articles, of course, are customarily sent to a few reviewers to check the quality of the contents before they are, are accepted for publication. Now, posting information in a global knowledge base or posting modules in a modular knowledge base is, is also a kind of publication in the sense of making things public. And it could be, it just could be worthwhile to consider a system where knowledge modules are reviewed by, for correct review for correct correctness uh, in, in a similar way. That is, uh, somebody who checks and now, uh, confidentiality would not necessarily have to be there, but then you would have people who check uh, for, a, for example, for the for use of concepts. And so if you have a thing like, for example, with the continents, if people correct, if individual people make local corrections to a knowledge base, then the choice whether a continent should be considered as only the lab mass or it should include the surrounding continental shelf could be done differently by different persons, and then we would have inconsistency on the, on the content level. Having uh, one person in charge of the reviewing on a module by module basis would be a better way of achieving the uh, coherence. And uh, then, of course, one of the problems with uh, uh, getting people to do this is, well, what's in it for me? We see this in the case of reviewing research articles, People do review it, but as a community service, but it is getting, it is sometimes quite difficult to, to get people to do the reviewing. In the case of knowledge modules, we would be seeing the same problem, but, but on the other hand, if there could also be a certain uh, credit, say CV credit, for doing this contribution to the work, then that could also help. So the scenario I to show is that the uh, correctness check of uh, modules in a modular knowledge base should consist of two parts, the format validation that you can document and the peer review that requires another type of structure. Then my final item has to do with attribution. Let me show you two quotations from the webpage of the Freebase. Uh, at the beginning of the website it says that the Freebase is a collaborative knowledge base in construction data harvested from many sources. Uh, and then uh, later on on the free days, there is some text uh, saying something about whether you can use it. So it says all the data contained in free days is licensed by the Commons and so on. Which means that it's free for you to browse, to query, to copy, and even to use the data in your own systems. All we ask in the term is that you mention that your product service, etc., uses free days data. Well, that's reasonable. But then, of course, you could ask, well, now, Freebase has harvested information from a lot of sources, so how does Freebase mention its sources? Does Freebase give up its own standards? Because presumably many of the sources were the top it harvested, but similar clauses in them, and even if they didn't, it would be, uh, really, it would be, you would expect them to, to put their sources. Now, what they do, is uh, that on the web page there is one long list of all uh, of uh, a lot of resources that they have used. Without any further details, it's just a list of everything. Now this is fair in a way, I mean, in that sense they, they quote what they've been using, but on the other hand it doesn't it doesn't really help with respect to the specific uh, and uh, 
from the point of view of the people who did the contribution, it would really be more useful if they could, if their contribution could be traced a bit further to what particular applications were developed. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you have an application that downloads and uses some specific parts of the freebase, in this example, and if that particular part of the free base is based on some specific sources in that long list that is on the web page, then it would be better if, if that particular application doesn't just merely mention free base, but mentions where the information came from. This would be in line with uh, what you normally do in the uh, second scientific research. So this is a question of giving proper credit to the people who've done the work. It is also a question of uh, being able to track backwards to see where do errors come from or where do misunderstandings come from. And you will see that uh, in order to do this in a systematic way, there is well, one possibility is to attribute provenance information, to associate provenance information with each particular link. But that uh, may be over specific and it doesn't handle the problems of the uniform uh, definition of the structure. If we have a modular knowledge base, then it would be reasonable to have have uh, attribution on a module per module basis. So that would be one of the things that one could gain with a modular organization. That's the end of my talk. I finish with one, day, one slide which shows the URLs of the common knowledge library that I'm using and the Leonardo software platform, which are the, shall we say, the experimental systems that are, are used for this purpose. The common knowledge library contains around 60,000 entities, each with a number of attributes, and there were several of the attributes are complex structures. So it is not enormous, it is uh, orders of magnitude smaller than several of the things that have been mentioned here today. But on the other hand, it's not a toy, it's something which has a reasonable size, and is sufficient size that trivial, trivial solutions to design problems uh, are not sufficient, and we have been confronted with relatively serious problems. Thank you.